Hello, we're here with Corey Eichner, who's running for Seattle City Council position number nine. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Again, my name is Corey Eichner, uh, running for Seattle City Council position nine. Uh, for the last 18 years, I've gone to work every day uh, serving our students and families in education as both a teacher and administrator in our public schools. I've had the privilege of working with our students and families across the region from Shoreline you know, down to South King County. As an advocate and leader for our kids, I have pushed for reform in our education system to ensure that our students and families who are furthest from educational justice have the access and opportunities they need to succeed. Today, as an administrator at Lincoln High School here in Seattle, I've continued this important work right here at home. I always share with people in education, you have to work together to get things done. And I have watched and seen the frustration grow with the inability of our city leaders to solve the problems we face here in Seattle. We have serious challenges and we are at a pivotal point where I have to believe that there is a better way to go about doing things than what we currently are doing. I might be new to Seattle politics, but I am not new to service and I have a track record for my work in schools and with kids. We need leaders who are committed to working together to get things done and move this city forward. I'm running for city council because we need new leadership to revive Seattle with renewed par partnerships and accountability. 30 seconds. Thank you so much. And I appreciate this opportunity and look forward to speaking with all of you. Great, thank you. So now we'll move into the prepared questions. Um, I will post the first one into the chat box and the responses to these are two minutes in length. Uh, Barbara, would you like to go ahead with the first question? I will. So um, this is about the homelessness crisis. What specific actions would you take and guide the council to take to address the homelessness crisis in Seattle, both in the short term and the long term. Please address uh, as brief, briefly as you can, land use, zoning, revenue, regional collaboration, the role of social services and the role of the police and justice system. Thank you. That's an awful lot to get to in two minutes, uh, but I, I would broadly say this, we have reached an absolute crisis point when it comes uh, to homelessness in, this, in, in the city. Um, I firmly believe it is, it is completely unjust and inhumane for um, unwarranted sweeps of those without homes throughout the city. That being said, it is just as unjust and unfair for us to not try to move forward, uh, to you know, assist and support those without homes in a way uh, that gets them back you know, on track and moving in the right direction. What the premise of this question is, is what I would actually offer is what we need to do. We need to bring it together a coalition of invested partners. We need community members. We need to bring together those without homes. We need folks from you know, housing experts. We need to bring in individuals with backgrounds in uh, job training and workforce support. We need to bring forward folks you know, who have uh, the expertise when it comes to social and emotional health training and services. We need to bring these folks together and we need to talk about what the appropriate solution is so that we can go out to those without homes and offer a viable option for them to move forward. What we are currently doing right now with our temporary housing is by de facto, our temporary housing has become permanent structures in our streets. That is not good for those without homes, nor is it good for the safety and security for our children, our kids, and our families. Seconds. So I propose that we bring this cohort, this coalition together for us to put together an action plan to say, this is what we need to do. This is how we need to get our temporary housing structures in place so that we can move forward with this crisis and not merely sit stagnant as we have. Great, thank you. Thank you. So now we'll move into question number two and Alice, if you would take this one. Sure. Um, what is your strategy for creating dense and diverse neighborhoods and assure, assuring housing, uh, affordable housing? How would you work to dismantle systemic racist arrangements, including but not limited to exclusionary zoning and land use policies? And finally, an addendum question, 
Do you support and would you sign city legislation to end single family zoning as Berkeley, California recently did? Yeah, I think I think first and foremost, what we need to recognize is that uh, you know racism is systemic and it permeates throughout you know you know our entire society, you know Seattle and beyond. Uh, you know, one aspect of policymaking that we don't always recognize is the unintended consequences of the policies that we have passed. Sometimes they're intended. A lot of times, even now, they're unintended. And so we have to be committed to what you were saying in the second part of your question, to actively analyze the policies and the practice that we have put in place with an equity tool and talking to those who are most negatively impacted by what's going on by these regulations that are in place. We have to do this on a regular basis because even with the best intent of new policies and practices that we pass, there is the chance that it is going to be working against what it was intended for. The ban the box law across the country is a prime example of this. While the intent of ban the box is certainly to support and help our ex-offenders, in reality, in many of our communities, it's worked against the hiring practices. This is a piece of policy making and city governance that doesn't regularly happen and needs to be a part of our regular uh, you know, policy analysis you know, tool that we do within city government. When it comes to urban planning, I like this idea, we need to be looking at dense urban planning. When we, if we don't do anything, we are gonna to continue to price folks out of Seattle like we've already been doing. And we need to think creatively about the best possible approach seconds. to make sure that we can ensure uh, access to our city. I support the idea and endorse that we should be looking at the existing plan for our mass transit and think about dense planning around those planned uh, metro routes so that we can be looking at creating affordable housing and through those access points that then would let, then lead to the public facilities and uh, uh, services that everyone's trying to access. To answer the very end of your question to make sure that you would get it, I would not support ending you know, single family uh, you know, zoning throughout Seattle, no. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll put in question number three and Mackenzie, would you take yeah. that? Um, would you decrease the Seattle Police Department budget and if so, by approximately what percentage? And what is your plan for the city's SPOG negotiations and do you support and will you advocate for ending qualified immunity for law enforcement? I think that's a tough question to ask and the way that we're going about it is actually the challenge that we are facing. You know, we certainly have, as I've mentioned already, institutional and systemic racism and challenges throughout our city. This is both within the Seattle Police Department as well as outside of that. To merely suggest that what we need to do is decrease funding isn't going about it in a way that's actually getting at the root cause or what we're trying to solve for. What I do support is looking at a myriad of ways for us to provide safety and security within our community. You know, even within our public schools, when you look at the approach of restorative practices or restorative pr approach to disagreements with our community, we should carry that to the city level. But with that, instead of going at this in the way of talking about how much we're going to defund one particular agency or one particular department in Seattle, what I think we should be doing is putting together a comprehensive plan and saying, here are the different agencies, here is the infrastructure that we are going to continue to provide safety and security for our entire community. Uh, LEAD is a prime example, a good infrastructure that we could be following in the way of a different approach that we could be taking. And then we look at allocating resources accordingly. If that then leads to, which it likely would, a reallocation of funds from one area to another, absolutely. But we need to go at it with a full plan of action as opposed to merely defunding one particular area with no action plan to make that happen. Now, certainly when you look at what's existing within law, within law enforcement, there are challenges that we have to overcome. And we need to be committed to be working with them directly, both with restructuring how we are providing safety and security through a variety of restorative, you know, you know, restorative ways, but also looking at the root problem within our different agencies with regards to our implicit bias and how we're going about interacting, you know, with those around us. So we definitely need to be doing that, but we need to go at it from a comprehensive fashion. Great, thank you. Uh, now I'll move into question number four, and I believe that's Mary Kylie. Hello, yes. 
How will you prioritize transportation infrastructure for biking, pedestrians, public transit, commercial vehicles, and cars? Which do you view as most important to prioritize funds for? Providing alternatives to transportation is an incredibly important thing that we need to face you know, here in Seattle because we have gridlock when it comes to congestions throughout the entire city. When I take a look at the list that you have in front of me, you know, of the most important uh, that I would prioritize first is certainly continuing to build out our mass transit system. This needs to be both within city, but also that regional approach. For us to have that most effective system, we not only need to be able to get from the north end, south end, east and west of the city effectively, all interconnected within a mass transit, we also then need to extend that to our outer cities, outer neighborhoods, you know, and outer suburbia to ensure that people can come and go from the city, whether for work or for pleasure. If we don't partner within a larger, you know, mass transit, you know, plan, having the best transit within the city doesn't actually get at the root cause or the root problem of all the congestion that is within the city for all those that are traveling in or traveling out for work or again, you know, leisure with, you know, within, within Seattle. So I would prioritize to the top in working with King County, King County Council and King County Transit to make sure that our systems are working together and that it is creating a full comprehensive transit system within and you know outside of you know outside of the city. Great, thank you. And now we'll move into questions from the board. And again, these responses are one minute one minute apiece. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. Hey there. Um, so I wanted to ask a little bit more about a time that you successfully brought together impacted community members to implement a policy change that was asked for by community? Sure, I think, um, you know, I would, you know, talk specifically about restorative practices, you know, within, within our public schools. And so both at my work at Renton High School and currently my work at Lincoln High School, you know, there is a desire both within and actually outside of the community to be looking at, you know, discipline practices in a different way on how we are working with our kids. Uh, there is the traditional model certainly within discipline uh, that has been certainly called into question on its effectiveness in through a variety of studies as well as my own personal practice. Um, but discipline and working with behavior for our students should certainly always be about learning. Um, and so utilizing the feedback from our community, our students, uh, and all stakeholders uh, within the different schools that I've been at, we've had to, you know, rethink and relook about how we go about, you know, our discipline and go, you know, go with it or go at it with a more restorative practice or restorative justice approach. Great, thank you. Uh, Mackenzie. Thanks. Uh, so I have a question. Um, what I was wondering is, is uh, the city of Tacoma recently just passed a, uh, a measure where they're going to implement a UBI pilot program. And uh, while I understand that part of that um, is going to be privately funded, what I'm curious is, is that something that you would be interested in trying to implement here in Seattle? And if so, um, uh, how would you go about funding that? You know, um, that would be an area that I have to look a little bit more into. Um, I mean, you're bringing something up in Tacoma that I'd have to you know, do a little bit more research on to see how that might look in Seattle. And so, you know, while I can't give a definitive whether I support it or whether I wouldn't support it, what I can talk about is the process that I would take, you know, as I work through issues on the city council. I think, you know, first and foremost, whenever we're looking at policy changes or what we're doing, you know, we need to engage with those who are most impacted by, you know, any of the issues or any of the topics that we're looking at to ensure that we're getting their feedback and their, their viewpoint on, you know, on what that is. I think we need to go and explore the pros and cons and examine, you know, the, uh, you know, financial and social impact of anything that we are doing and really try to stay focused on seconds. what the intent of uh, what we're trying to accomplish. Lastly, you know, because of my strong equity focus, I believe that we should always be applying an equity lens and an equity audit on everything that we are doing as a last stage before we move into implementation. Great. Thank you. Any further questions? I can, uh, yes, Mackenzie, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Nicole, you were gonna ask something? Oh, well, I was just gonna um, ask the question from our uh, environment committee. Um, I know there was two that they asked, but I've been reading 
uh, one. Uh, so they asked, uh, how would you use your the office to address climate justice, to ensure a healthy environment and access to climate supporting solutions, such as multimodal clean transportation options for all residents? Yeah, great question. I think one of the challenges that we have with you know promoting uh, you know a healthy environment and, cl and climate change is we look at it as an either or. We look at what we have and we say we either need to go with this or we need to go with that. You know, I actually look at climate change more from an economic standpoint of view, in that we can promote positive you know moves towards improving our climate and advancing our economy at the exact same time. I'm going to go back to the mass transit example. We know carbon emissions is you know one of the largest you know contributors you know, to or gas powered vehicles is one of the largest contributor to our carbon emissions throughout the state. We need to do something about that. And so as we are looking at building an infrastructure of mass transit around the city and the region, we need to be leaning into and creating this system in and around a commitment seconds. to, you know, no carbon, no carbon vehicles. We should be looking at electric to do that, which will both boost our economy invest into you know, added technology and move us towards the goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. So I think we need to change and reframe the approach and not an either or, but how we can do this in benefiting us in our economy as well. Great, thank you. Uh, Barbara, then Mackenzie. Thank you. So um, considering your experience with education and your concern for kids, what standing committees in the council would you look to participating in? And specifically, what business is going before them that you have a special interest or a special contrib contribution to make currently? Certainly. I mean, obviously, there's no doubt that I have an interest in deal and really working with, you know, education um, and early in early literacy with on, within the council. Uh, when I look at the role of city governance, as well as the Seattle Public Schools, I see a lot of missed opportunities that we need to be capitalizing on. A couple of examples that I would give on this, certainly COVID has highlighted the inequities that we have found, uh, you know, throughout our system. When we look at early stages of uh, you know, COVID, we worked really hard as a city and as a district to provide childcare for our first responders. This was a great you know, first step, but what we really need to be also looking at is how are we providing the same level of services for our families who needed that support for their kids who were at home. We had plenty of our students who were unable to fully seconds. engage in the online environment solely because we didn't have the adequate childcare resources allocated to those who might need it. And that was a partnership and a missed opportunity that we had through early literacy deals and the city with SPS. Great, thank you. Um, Mackenzie. Thank you. Um, in some of your response to homelessness, you had mentioned that you'd be you would want to put together like a coalition of invested partners. And then um, in another point, you mentioned you would uh, getting an action plan together. So um, a couple of questions from that is first, um, do you support Compassion Seattle's charter amendment? And um, whether yes or no, uh, do you have exact plans of what you would want to do like already in place? No, I don't have exact plans. I think that's actually one of the challenges that we you know, are facing in city governance, as well as elected leaders. When we come in with a you know, predisp predisposition of exactly what we need to do, it actually goes against what democracy is about, which is a, the whole idea is us coming together with a range of ideas to come together with common sense you know, solutions for us to move forward. So I don't have an exact action plan on what that might be, but I do have the commitment to come together and bring these parties together with the end goal of actually us moving forward and not merely being stuck on, you know, looking at the very true statement that it is inhumane for us to be trying to remove homeless encampments, but not actually finding a way for us to move forward either in the city seconds. or from the regional approach. The charter amendment I have been really intrigued by um, it's an area that I have to look a little bit more into. I can't say definitive yes or definitive no. The piece about the Charter Amendment that is intriguing is, of course, its movement towards action-oriented as well as accountability for the city to actually be problem-solving around one of our biggest issues facing everyone. 
Great, thank you. And so now we're close to time. So if you would go ahead and give a one minute wrap up. All right, well, thank you so much for this uh, you know, opportunity. Um, my campaign is just beginning, um, but I am running for city council because I do believe that we are at a pivotal point in the city. We have serious challenges and the frustration is growing at our inability to solve the problems here in Seattle. You know, over what could be the status quo, I offer a new approach. As a teacher and administrator, I have a track record of bringing people together to advance reform and problem solve in our education system. If people want to see city government that is committed to working towards solutions and not creating additional barriers, then I invite you all to check us out at www.coryactor.com. Thanks so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you.